Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to describe the optimal render settings we're going to use when working with cycles. And what I mean by the optimal render settings is, well, I need to use this image you can see to help me out with it, and it's a chocopher triangle. So when setting up the rendering in cycles, there are three things you have to consider. It's the render quality you're aiming at, it's the render time, it's gonna take cycles to render your image, and it's also a setup, setup time. So the amount of time you need to actually prepare all of the settings in order for your scene to render. So as with most of the magic triangles like the one I've showed you, you can only choose two of the three options. So in our case, we have to consider if we want to have a good render quality and a good render time, but then we will have to sacrifice the setup time. So we are gonna need to take additional minutes, sometimes hours in order to set up just the one camera because oftentimes you need to do completely different setup or slightly different setup for another camera as I did in our scene. Uh, with the second camera where I had to change the background in order for it to look correctly. You may also aim at a quick render time and a quick setup time, but your render quality will suffer this way. It's really not possible to quickly set up a scene that will render quickly as well, but have a good photorealistic quality at the same time. And all that leads us to the triangle setup that I'm going to use, which I'm going to show you in this course, and which I'm using basically in vast majority of my projects. The setup is good render quality with a decent setup time, and I'm sacrificing render times when working this way. But let me tell you one thing about the render times. I think it's not that much of an issue nowadays where image like the one we are working on used to take up to eight hours to render, let's say three to four years back. And today you can have a pretty, well, Medicore laptop like mine, which has uh, GTX 9, uh, sorry, GTX 1070 on board, pretty good render uh, setup, but it's two and a half years old already. And it takes just 15 minutes to render this image on my computer. So I guess if you buy something new and up to date, the render times will be even lower. So you can reduce them simply by upgrading your hardware. And I really think nowadays render times are really not that much of an issue. I know there are people who really try to crank down the render times as much as they can, but Unless you're working on an animation, I think if you're able to deliver this kind of image like the one we are working on in between one or two hours of render time per frame, per full HD frame, I think that's pretty good result because it's really not that often where you have to deliver four or five images like this every single day. And that would still be something you could achieve with one to two hours per render time per image. And normally when you're sending an image like this to the client, it usually takes one or even two days before you receive a feedback and answer if there are any changes or not. So you still have plenty of room to do some test renderings. And yeah, as I said, one or two hours per rendering is really not that bad. And you can still upgrade it either by changing the hardware which, yeah, costs some money, but you're working professionally or you plan working professionally, so you have to consider those kind of things happening. Or you can simply use an external render farm and render an image like this for one or two dollars. And I'm gonna cover the topic of external render farms uh, in the advanced part of this course, but let's now jump into the actual render settings. So the render settings I'm going to show you right now, as I mentioned in the previous video, are the settings I'm using in, I think, 99% of my projects. I really quite rarely optimize the render settings per camera because I still want to have the flexibility. If I 
move my camera, let's say, to this angle, to this angle, or here, I really want to, I, I still prefer to have a general universal render settings that will work with, let's say, 99% of the, of the time in the scene, instead of setting up the settings just for this one camera and reducing the render times by, let's say, 20%. So I'm gonna go through the render settings you have under this icon here. First one is the color management. And as you can see, I'm just leaving them as defaults. You can of course modify them for a different looks, but I will also describe it uh, in a separate video, actually in the next video. But let's now move to the sampling settings. And this is, I would say a general setting for the general quality. So the more samples you set up here, the less noise, the more crisp and defined your rendering will be. As for the viewport, I usually use the values of 256. You can go with the default 100 as well if you want to preview the shaders, actually as we did in the whole previous chapter. But as for the rendering, for the interior scenes, I'm using the 1024, you can use 1000 as well, uh, as a minimum volume. And I know you can go a little bit lower with this if you set up your scene, if you try to crank the render times within your scene. But this is the value that will influence the render times the most. So as I said, I try to start with the value of 1000 usually works well with bright interiors like the one we have if we want to make if you want to be super sure that the render quality will be good and the render times still stay quite rational we can go with 1500 but i'm just going to use 1024 as for the advanced settings here there's really not nothing to well that I change at this point. So I basically just stick to the render samples here. And then I move to the light paths. So here we have three categories and this is the area where I change the most settings. So for the general interiors like ours, you should consider switching off all of the caustics. These are the settings that usually generate uh, some noise especially in the scenarios where you have light sources like the sun lamp going past the glass objects or if you have too many reflective materials around the scene, I would suggest disabling these ones. I mean, I'm disabling anyways because the caustic effect they would generate is very, very small and still that can produce some extra noise. Um, then I go to the clamping settings and the default values I set here is nine. What those values do, I will explain that in the advanced part of the course, but in general, you can think of those as the values that reduce noise. So if you have them set up as zero, you will usually get quite a lot of noise around your scene. If you go to the value around 10, I usually use nine, um, that should shouldn't influence the, your image quality that much because if you go with very low values like one, uh, that will flatten out the lights within your image. So yeah, let's just stick to the values of nine. And as for the bounce settings, I'm usually increasing these from the default four to uh, six. Some people say it really doesn't do anything around the scenes and you can keep them around two or three. I disagree with that, in my opinion, especially the diffuse one increases the brightness of your scene. It affects the render times slightly, so this might increase the render time by 10, maybe ex in extreme cases 20%, but I don't think that's really um, a big problem for us. And I still prefer to have this additional light around my scene and let's say 10, 15 uh, longer render times. As you can see, I've opened the hair settings for no reason because we don't change anything here. So there is also a simplify menu here, which I will describe in a second. Um, nothing also changes within the motion blur since we are not doing the animation. 
in the film settings uh, you can enable transparency if you want to have a JPEG image placed in your background but we'll get back to that in a separate video so in terms of performance here are some things we need to set up so you might consider starting with the tiles and if you're using a GPU as I do here the most optimal and more or less always working value here I found out at least for me is 400 if you're using a simple uh, single GPU so if you don't if you have multiple graphic cards that might be different uh, sometimes having lower resolutions so if you change the dimensions of your rendering let's say for a preview purposes to 50% here I would suggest uh, changing this value to let's say 250 because then it's a little bit more optimized so you might consider using the value of 256 most of the time especially if you're doing a lot of previews in lower resolution but once you get to this 100% rendering I would suggest increasing those values to yeah somewhere between 200 and 400 I'm just using 400 most of the time and it's important to mention if you're using CPU here so let's say you're using your uh, MacBook to render this scene these values will carry your render time so you have to go very low with that I usually go with 8 um, some people say it shouldn't be any lower than 16 in my case it really depended on the scene I was working on but something between using 8 or 16 I would say that's the best You'll, you're gonna get the best render times with those two values um, you can do some test renderings on a region and see which one renders faster for you but as for the GPU I would stick with 400 let's see some other settings we have here as for the acceleration structure I barely ever change anything from the defaults as for the final render you might consider switching on the persistent images option here which saves uh, you some time when loading the textures into cycles and you can also use save buffers option which saves a little bit of VRAM GPU RAM memory when rendering and speaking of memory if you have problems rendering an image if you're long, running low with the VRAM memory the simplify option may be a very good help for you so what you can do here is telling blender to well simplify some things when rendering as you can see I tried switching it on and we got some problems but here we go again so you can see we have the max subdivisions option here and what it does uh, with this slider here you can actually set up the maximum values of the subdivision uh, modifier values you have here so let's say you have some objects with the value of 3 some of the value of 2 some of the value of 4 let's say or maybe let's not overdo it just so it doesn't, so it doesn't crash um, what you can do here is actually telling blender to go down with all of those values to what you set up here I don't know why would anyone use the max subdivisions set up to six uh, but you can go yeah lower with all of that so let's say for viewport we can use two but for rendering if you're running into the VRAM memory problems you can set it up as one as soon as blender starts working for me again okay so we set it up as one but the subdivision values are usually not the biggest issue when it comes to VRAM problems what I found really problematic were the actual texture sizes because sometimes you're using a texture which has a pretty big resolution and with a big resolution comes bigger memory use so let me show you an example here we have exactly the same texture which has exactly the same resolution in both cases but when I uh, 
click here you can see with this one we have 6000 by 6000 pixels and 20 megabytes of well memory use and with this one we have exactly the same resolution exactly the same look and only four megabytes of memory use so that really depends how your texture was prepared how it was compressed to the final image but quite often you might have those kind of textures spread around your scene and with just 10 of these you already lose 200 sometimes 400 megabytes of your vram memory which is quite precious so what you can do with the simplify options here not for the viewport but for the render you can tell blender to limit all texture sizes to let's say 2048 by 2048 and in some of my projects i found it extremely helpful it really made a night and day difference in some projects which i couldn't simply render even on eight gigabytes of vram memory when i used this kind of trick to optimize my scene it really well made it possible to render and to finish my project the other settings here like the one i've just opened i basically leave untouched and one more thing last but definitely not least is the denoiser and we can find it under this strange layer kind of icon here so you can see we have the denoising settings available around this area and what it does it makes well our rendering much more smoother you will see the before and after denoising comparison under this video uh, but yeah in general i also leave all of those settings as they are because the noiser can generate some splotches some well ugly dots around some of your renderings but the main reason for them to happen to appear is the low sampling uh, value here so in order to make the denoiser work better you simply need to increase the values here i mean most of the time you can obviously crank down those settings just a little bit more but as i said i would still prefer to have longer render times instead of playing around with the settings and you know guessing which setup works the best because quite often this is uh, just a guessing game how to set those up so yeah other than that i basically leave our scene as it is i would say we still did a quite of good job with setting up the illumination optimizing the way light distributes uh, in the scene by tweaking the glass material here in the cycle settings that actually makes a really big difference and really this is actually those kind of things actually cut your render times and improve the look of your scene not necessarily the tweaks you do here because as you can see we really don't have that many options to play with even when the light path which is the most i would say important thing to set up if you want to have a good rendering quality and a general look there aren't that many settings to play around with so i would say that's it for this video and let's now move on with this part of the course thank you for watching thank you guys for watching this video is part of my interior visualization course in blender which you can watch for free on youtube all the necessary details and link to the full playlist can be found in the video description if you want to support what i do and access all of the 3d files used in this course plus blender ready interior setups and over 2000 blender exclusive 3d models just visit the chocofor store and learn more about our subscription plans again thanks for watching and i see you soon